In part one, we discussed the, the value of using a phytase, not just in destroying IP6, but also in breaking down IP4 and IP3, which are also in their own right anti-nutrients. And it's only when you remove IP4 and IP3 as well as IP6 that you see the major benefits of superdosing. Here in part two, what I want to discuss is what happens when you break phytic acid all the way down to inositol. The point is, inositol itself seems to have a valuable role to play in terms of a nutrient for the animal. Originally, we think of phytases as being used simply to release phosphorus, which is a nutrient which has economic value. However, as discussed in part one, we also now want to consider phytases as a means to break down phytic acid, IP6, and release phosphorus, yes, of course it does, and then breaks down IP5 and IP4 and IP3, which were identified in part one as being significant anti-nutrients in their own right. In this part, what I want to discuss is what happens when we break down IP3 to IP2 and then IP2 to IP1. Since IP1 is a substrate for the animal's own endogenous alkaline phosphatases, and with these enzymes, the animal can take off the last phosphorus from IP1, producing inositol. And that is the focus of this talk. Why are we interested in inositol? It was first shown to be a nutrient which promotes growth in chickens way back in 1941. Now, this was a diet that supposedly had all the nutrient requirements of the animal within. As you can see from the data here presented by Hegstead, in fact, just provision of a small amount of inositol improved body weight gain of chickens. So this suggested that inositol has a value as a required nutrient. Further work by Zeiler in 2004 showed that feeding just one kilogram of inositol to chickens improved growth rate and it nearly improved feed conversion ratio just simply by adding one kilogram of this material into diets. This again suggests that inositol is playing a role as a nutrient which will improve the performance, prove the, improve the efficiency of the animal when added at a kilogram per tonne, which isn't very much. Work in our own laboratory has shown that when we use phytases at higher levels, we start to generate an awful lot of inositol in the gizzard of the chicken. This set of data on this visual shows on the right-hand side the four treatments of interest and negative control quantum blue at 500, 1,000, or 1,500 units. And if you look at the very dark blue bars, this is a measure of the amount of inositol we found in the gizzard when feeding these various levels of phytase. And you can see the more phytase that is fed, the higher the level of inositol generated in the gizzard. So there clearly is inositol provision when we use a phytase. Interesting, if you look at the, the table associated with this graph, you can see a very highly positive correlation between the concentration of inositol found in the gizzard and the performance of the animal as measured by GAIN or FCR. So it's suggesting the more inositol we generate, the better the FCR, the better the GAIN of the animal. This doesn't prove that inositol is required or actually stimulates growth. So how do we know that inositol is involved in the superdosing effect of quantum blue? On this graph, you can see the left-hand two bars relate to birds that have been superdosed. On the left, the left of those two bars is no phytase. On the right-hand bar, we can see 1,500 units being fed. And, and with this, we can see a very significant improvement in FCR. If we now move to the bars three and four, what you can see is the effect of superdosing in the presence of three kilograms of added inositol. We chose three kilos because this is the amount of inositol that you would generate if you were to dephosphorylate all of the phytic acid in a typical corn soy diet. So you can see by comparing bars one and three that feeding three kilograms of inositol results in a significant improvement in FCR in its own right. This simply confirms what's been shown before by Zeiler and Hegstead. When we superdose those animals which received three kilograms of inositol, you still get a significant response in FCR, but it's not as large as you see when you do not feed inositol. So the conclusion from this work is that inositol is part of the response of superdosing, but not the whole story. We believe that inositol provision is probably worth about 30% of the total response in superdosing. How do we know when inositol is actually produced in the gut, it's absorbed and used by the animal? The growth performance data showed previously suggests that's the case, but when we use a phytase, how do we know the inositol is being picked up? 
This work shows very nicely that when you use 500 or 2500 units of phytase, you see a significant and dose-dependent increase in inositol levels in the plasma of piglets. This clearly shows that, yes, when we superdose, we do see inositol entering the animal's bloodstream. What it actually does, though, we don't really know. There's many, many roles that inositol plays. Which role is responsible for the growth response we see when we superdose? Nobody's quite sure. Inositol is involved in so many different parts of metabolism, it does suggest, however, that current diets are deficient in inositol, and superdosing is a means to actually provide that deficient nutrient. So, with part of the superdosing response, it may well be associated with an ostol provision. This is in addition to phytate destruction and IP4 and IP3 destruction. So, superdosing gets rid of antinutrients, but it also provides a nutrient, inositol. Now, not all phytases are able to do this in the same way. Specifically, the phytase has to survive the processing of animal feed. This is high temperature and can break down most proteins. So the phytase has to be intrinsically thermostable. It also has to survive the conditions in the stomach, which is where the phytase work. And this means it's got to be able to survive in low pH and in the presence of proteolytic enzymes such as pepsin. Most importantly, however, the phytase has to be able to break down IP6, IP5, IP4, IP3 and IP2, all the way down to IP1, very, very rapidly indeed. And this has to be done in a quantitative manner. We have to get rid of most of the IP6543, since these are antinutrients, but we also have to provide as much IP1 as possible so that the animal can break that down and produce the inositol, which is the subject of this series. So superdosing is not simply breaking down IP6, it's not simply breaking down IP4 and IP3, all of which are antinutrients. It's also producing inositol, which is a nutrient which appears to be required by the broiler chicken and by the piglet in modern day diets. Not all phytases can do this, simply because they are not as equally efficient at breaking down IP6, IP4 and IP3 rapidly enough to provide the IP1 so that the inositol can be produced by the animal in the gut. Thank you.